I was sitting in fleet chat the other day when one of my corp mates jumped in and said to me, hang on, you're flying the Drekovac at the moment and doing a video on that. How about the Kikimura? I really like that ship. What can that do in wormholes? I mean, you've got a Wolf IA up at the moment. Could it run that? And I looked around and there was indeed a C3 Wolf IA. And I do indeed have a Kikimura. And I thought, okay, let's put those two together and see how this does. So I undocked the Kikimura, I took it into that C3 Wolf IA, and the results genuinely surprised me, like astonished me. This is a ship that I've really enjoyed for a long time. I love the look of it, I love the aesthetics, I love the entropic disintegrators and how those work, but I've never really had much of an opportunity to undock the Kikimura. And I kind of look at it now, and I wish I'd undocked this sooner. Here's why. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. In this video we're going to be taking a look at the Treglavian Collective's Kiki Mora Destroyer. This is just a gorgeous looking ship, I love the angularity, I've said before I adore the whole power cell thing that the Treglavians have going on, they're just so moody and aggressive, they look like something out of Doom and just brought into EVE and in a really good way. I also love the lore behind the Triglavians and behind their naming conventions. Did you know that the Kikimora is not in fact a giant spider-like creature as you see in The Witcher? If you've watched Netflix's adaptation of The Witcher, it's the big spider-like thing that Geralt fights in the very first episode. You do fight it in the games and it's in the first book as well. That's not what a Kikimora is in Slavic folk tradition. It's actually a little bit more disappointing than that. In fact, a Kikimora is a kind of house spirit. It is a house spirit and guardian of chickens, and it's often sort of depicted as this small female half chicken, half imp thing that lives in your house and is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the owner. If you are a good owner and you look after your Kikimora, it will help out around the house. If you are a bad owner for, of your home, if you let your house fall into disarray and become untidy, then the Kikimora becomes a bit of a bad spirit and starts getting up to all kinds of mischief, including causing, supposedly, sleep paralysis. So yes, it's not quite the giant spider-like demon monster that you may have uh, anticipated, and more a half chicken, half imp house guest. But there we are, it's still a really cool ship, and in this video, I'm going to showcase it running a C3 Wolf Raye, where genuinely the results were surprising. I cannot believe how well this ship did. And please stick around to the end because there was one of the most intense moments I've had in J Space life in a long time. If you do enjoy this video or find it useful, please hit like, drop a comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and if you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, check out my Patreon page, my PayPal tip jar, and my Redbubble merchandise store. Finally, if you are new to EVE Online and finding these videos for the first time, come join the Catskull Discord, loads of people there looking to help out as best they can. We do have a corporation that will help new players get you into wormhole space and things like that. I've got a referral link where you can earn a million free skill points, no matter how old your account is, as long as you haven't used a referral code before, and I do monthly giveaways. All that said and done then, let's jump right into talking about the Triglavian Collective Kiki Mora. Before I showcase the fit, and definitely before I showcase this in action, we need to talk about the Kikimora, what it is and how it works. So we're going to have a look at the ship's traits and stats and all of that in just a moment. It is worth spending a brief moment aside to talk about how these skills work for Triglavian ships, because this can be confusing for newer players looking to fly these. Ultimately, normally you just open your skill book, you pick the skills you want and you buy them, right? Well, that is not possible with the Triglavian ships. Any skill that has Precursor in the name is not currently available in the skill book. You do have to go to your market and either buy the skill books directly there, or you can farm Abyssal Dead Spaces and see if they are lucky enough to drop for you. Now for the Kikimora, there are two skills that we need to look at, Small Precursor Weapon and Precursor Destroyer. It's worth noting that this fit does work with Precursor Destroyer 4 and Small Precursor Weapon 4. That said, in this video I am using Precursor Destroyer 4 and Small Precursor Weapon 5 with the Small Disintegrator Specialization skill trained to 1 so that I can use Tech 2 ammunition. That said, again, you can run this at 4 and 4, and if you do decide to go a bit higher, well, the ship only gets better, right? 
So let's have a look at its bonuses. First of all, the roll bonuses. We get a 50% bonus to Light Entropic Disintegrator optimal range, so our Light Entropic Disintegrators have better range. It's worth noting that Entropic Disintegrators do not have an optimal range and a fall off, they only have optimal range. You are either in range or you are not, there is no scaling involved in that. We get a 50% reduction to energy neutralizer capacity need, which doesn't help us because we're going into PvE and energy newts do nothing to rats. A 50% reduced remote armor repair capacity need, useful if we were spider tanking, but again, we're doing this solo. 50% reduced smart bomb capacity need, not important to us at all, and 100% bonus to remote armor repair at range. Again, nice for spider tanking, but basically of the roll bonuses, the only one we actually care about here is that 50% bonus to the light entropic disintegrator optimal range. Then we have Precursor Destroyer. This I've got trained up to four. Again, by training it to five, you're only going to do better than I can. So Precursor Destroyer. This gives us a 25% bonus to Light Entropic Disintegrator damage, or at training of four, that's 100% bonus, 125% bonus at level five. And a 20% bonus to Light Entropic Disintegrator optimal range. That does stack with the roll bonus. And again, at level four, that's an 80% bonus to the optimal range, or 100% if you train this to level 5, so worth bearing in mind. With all that said and done though, let's jump into talking about the fit itself. So I'm going to simulate this and we're going to talk about how this works and why I've set it up the way I have. This fit will be linked in the description down below and of course feel free to change it. I'm not suggesting this is the best fit, this is just the fit that I have working and I would love to hear what you do with this and how you make it even better in the, in the comment section down below. Link your fit, tell me how you get on. So, we're going to be running C3 anomalies in this. They are going to need to be Wolf Raie systems. If you're not sure what a C3 Wolf Raie is, make sure to go watch my videos on surviving wormholes. Basically, my wormhole 101 and my wormhole 102 will explain all of that for you, and I will try to remember to link that in the description down below. Otherwise, just search it on the channel. Now, that in mind, what is a Wolf Raie? Well, a Wolf Raie is a weather effect, kind of, in a system. It increases the damage of small weapons, it increases your armor hit points, and it decreases your signature radius. Those are all really nice things for the Kikimura. Smaller signature radius means it's harder to hit, more armor means, well, more armor, and more damage is, again, more damage, which is really, really useful to us. Beyond that as well, it does have the negative of massively reducing your shield resistances, but considering we've barely got any shields on this anyway, it really doesn't matter. It's like, oh well, so I can just pretend I don't even have shields, which is kind of how you should be flying one of these anyway. But that bonus to the weapon damage is huge, the bonus to the armor is huge, and the signature radius reduction is really nice as well, because you can see we're very small signature radius anyway, um, all the way down here at 58 meters. If you were taking this into a C-13, for example, which is a Wolf or IA that is a, a full power, basically, that's actually 29 meter signature radius, which is diminutive, to say the least. Anyway, the fit. High slots, Velesh Light Entropic Disintegrator. I really like the Velesh Light Entropic Disintegrator, same with the mediums and the uh, heavies and the super titles. Essentially, you can go for just a Light Entropic Disintegrator 1, but it's not that great. And a Light Entropic Disintegrator 2 is actually not as good as the Velesh either and requires you to go all the way up to Small Precursor Weapon 5. You can use the Velesh with Small Precursor Weapon 1. I mean, I wouldn't undock the ship until I had 4, but you know what I mean. It's, it's possible to use this without full skills. You can also see here nicely with a Cult S in there, which is the ammo type, um, 14 kilometer optimal range and 14 kilometer fall off. That means there is no fall off. You are either in range or you are not. There is no such thing as being beyond optimal. If you're beyond optimal, you are not firing. This is the Occult, which is the short range high power version. So we're starting at 223.3 DPS. But remember, that is going to increase the longer we are shooting at a particular target. The way Entropic Disintegrators work is, as long as they are targeting the same thing and active, then the DPS will increase every single cycle. And as you'll see later, this can actually push this frigate at this destroyer all the way up to 1,100 DPS against certain targets, which is just an incredible amount of damage for a destroyer to be putting out. The trouble is, the second you change target, 
you reset that DPS right back to the beginning. So do bear that in mind. Try and start shooting at a target and do not stop. This has the unusual thing with a Triglavian ship of essentially actually being better for you not to swap to shorter range ammo as you get in range. Essentially keep the long range ammo going and the DPS will just keep on climbing. Whereas if you now are, if you want to try and get closer, then yes, you are going to have to reset, but it's up to you to kind of figure out when you should reset and when you shouldn't. A simple idea of this is, for example, if you're orbiting a cruiser, if you're approaching a cruiser and you're using, say, your 49 kilometer ammo or whatever, your 30 kilometer range to shoot at that cruiser on approach, you should probably keep that ammo going and just stay at 30 kilometers in order to get the tracking and all that properly. But if you're going up against a battleship that you need to orbit at 500, start shooting it at range, but when you get close, then yes, yeah, swap to your closer ammo and just start the DPS cycle again. The other high slot I've gone for here is a core probe launcher, useful in case I have to make a, a B for it um, and I end up losing myself and have to scan down an exit hole. You could go for a prototype cloak here. Nice and easy, uh, nice and useful if you do want to like run away to a safe point and then cloak up, but considering we've only got that one high slot, I think the probe launcher is more important. You could theoretically carry a mobile depot and then refit, carry the cloak with you to get out to safety and then have a mobile depot with a probe launcher and some uh, probes in it. It feels a bit excessive for the armor, uh, for the for the cargo hold, but you do have space to make that work. It's it's a consideration, right? It's a consideration. It's entirely up to you. For me, I think I know how to run away well enough that the probe launcher is the better option for me. For the mid slots, I've got a Republic Fleet small cap battery in both of these slots here. This is to help with cap stability. Remember that these uh, these sleepers do a lot of neutralization. This is, mm, again, slightly misleading as we'll see up here in a moment. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but essentially we are using that just to fuel one Corelli A-type small armor repairer. That can be turned on and off as needed. But for the most part, we're probably gonna keep that on whilst we're taking damage. Now what this means is we're taking five point, well we have 5.4 gigajoules of excess capacitor recharge rate. That is not quite enough to survive the one newt that will be left over in wave two of a fortification frontier stronghold. Essentially the second wave of fortification frontier stronghold has two awakened upholders, each of which do six gigajoules of neutralization. That is therefore enough, you, you're, and because those are the trigger, you can only kill one of them at, at a time. You get two of them spawned, so you start with 12 gigajoules per second of neutralization, you kill one of them, you drop to six gigajoules of neutralization per second, it means that you are not going to actually have enough new, uh, enough capacitor stability to survive that indefinitely. Fortunately, you shouldn't need to. You're so small and fast that essentially you can then turn off your armor repairer and cycle it as needed, and you'll see you're now at 13.7, which is more than enough to survive that neutralization. We do, in the mid slots, otherwise have a one mega newton afterburner too. This could be blinged out if you wanted it to. I've tried to keep this fairly cheap at 219 uh, million there, but you could theoretically bling this out a little bit if you want to go that little bit faster. Honestly, I think a one mega newton afterburner two is absolutely fine on this. For the low slots then, it's a Corelli A-type small armor repairer, which is probably the most expensive module on here other than the Velesh, followed by two multi-spectrum energized membrane twos and an entropic radiation sink two. Essentially, this is about pushing those resistances up, this is about repairing as much as we can, and this is about increasing our damage. Again, we start at 223, but remember that spools up, and our resistances are a little bit lower than I would like, but that is kind of counteracted by the fact that we have a very small signature radius, and the Wolf IA system that we're going to be in makes it even smaller. For the rigs, small capacitor control circuit 2, small auxiliary nanopump 2, small auxiliary nanopump 1. Again, the auxiliary nanopumps are about making your armor reps better, the capacitor control circuit is about helping keep your capacitor as stable as possible, and basically that's kind of it. Pick your targets, knowing what you need to kill, orbit, and just destroy. This can work in any C2 system. If you are C2 ratting, the Kikimora is an excellent choice for that. If you want to go into a C13, the Kikimora is absolutely the king of it, but let's showcase it in a standard C3 Wolf Raye and see how it holds up in that. And remember, stick around to the end because things get pretty spicy. 
Having set up my safe spot, I'm gonna walk in now to a C3 fortification frontier stronghold. You should be familiar with these sites by now if you're familiar with my content. They are my preferred C3 combat site, and by running these side by side um, in all the different ships, you can see the time difference and how quickly they kill things. Now, warping in on site, remember the Kiki Mora is SIG tanking, and that means movement needs to happen immediately. Get the afterburner running, get the uh, ship moving in a direction that has a bit of angular velocity going on, to reduce the incoming damage. We do have a smaller signature radius thanks to the Wolf IA effect. Um, that's dropped it by 29%, I think, on a C3 site. Um, but it's, you know, still you need to be moving to avoid those wrecking shots. We then get the armor repairer up and running, and we're gonna go after the emergent defenders first of all. The uh, awakened defenders are the triggers, emergent defenders are frigates as well, so we just kind of want to shoot those nice and quickly. Tetrion ammo, or occult ammo rather, just to nuke through those. And you can see how quickly that shoots through that emergent defender. We're going to bookmark the MTU, drop the MTU and bookmark it, set up a decent orbit because I know what I'm going to be going up against in a moment. And we're going to go after these awakened defenders. Now again, I sort of recommend you take a look at the damage profile. 423 there for a penetrates, 221 for a graze, I'm gonna get the ramping, 512 for a smash. This ramps up very quickly. Remember the Wolf Rye effect is also increasing our small weapon damage, again by a not insignificant amount, it's like 50% additional damage at this point in time, which gives us some really quite potent firepower. And it will rip through these cruisers very, very quickly quickly. I mean, you can see how quickly that's going down already, that Awakened Defender. Oof, unlucky shot there, but again, let's see what happens as we get, oh, there we are, half of hull and then down, start to orbit at five kilometers on the other Awakened Defender. The downside of the Occult S is, of course, that it is small range, short range, 14 kilometers or 13,900 to be exact. But again, um, we're a fast moving ship, so we can get into range quite quickly and then start with those. That's also only the Occult if you are only running on, say, small precursor weapon four, then this still works. You just don't have the occult for the quite as fast clear time because you're able to get into that range quickly. You just use Tetrion, which is still very high DPS, um, has slightly longer range, I think you'll find, but yeah. Essentially, you can run this still with precursor weapon four and precursor destroyer four. I'm actually sitting in precursor destroyer four still in this ship. Um, I do obviously have small precursor weapon five and small disintegrator specialized at one so that I can use the specialist ammo. But again, if this is a ship you want to fly more, then you can skill into it deeper than I have um, and do it for all kinds of stuff. Wave two is now spawning. Um, here I'm going to swap back to Mystic S because I should theoretically be going after the Awakened Upholders first. Awakened Upholders, Web and Newt, they have six gigajoules of neutralization and fairly nasty webs. They like to orbit at 30 kilometers as well, which means that you do have to swap to longer range ammunition. Um, but I've kind of started hitting the Awakened Defender here. And this is an important point to note when it comes to using Triglavian weapons and Tropic Disintegrators. If you start on one target, your DPS is ramping up, right? If I swap to something else right now, I reset that DPS ramp. So when I come back to this target, I have to start that ramp again. So it kind of, if you make the mistake of targeting the wrong thing and start shooting at it, you do need to just work out in your own mind if it's worth swapping target to something else and letting the DPS reset, or whether you just let it ramp and burn that target and then move on to the next one. In this case, I've flown away at a bit of a stupid straight line, so I've taken quite a bit of damage because I'm not sig tanking properly um, by reducing my uh, traversal velocity to essentially zero by flying in a straight line away. I took a lot of damage, but now that we're at that range, we're now orbiting, my signature radius is tiny, um, you can see suddenly the armor repairer is more than keeping up again. I'm now gonna take out that first awakened up holder because the two of them together is really hurting my ship's capacitor. Um, even with one of them alive, I'm not gonna be capacitor stable, but I can't kill both of them without triggering wave three. And theoretically you could think, oh, well, you know, triggering wave three with one extra cruiser there, one awakened defender, that's not a huge problem, right? And it's kind of not, but equally, it's just another thing shooting at you while you've got a lot more neutralization going on. I'd rather have myself set up nicely and trigger the wave in a controlled manner. Anyway, we're moving in on that Waken Defender now. You can see I'm gonna start shooting on that. Let's skip ahead to said third wave. 
With the death of this Awakened Up holder, Wave 3 is going to spawn. I'm a little bit further away than I'd like, but again, we're a small, fast ship. Double tap in space, get that angular velocity up immediately. That Sleepless Up holder, once it locks you, does massive amounts of damage if you're a sitting duck. It's a turret-based weapon that deals most of its DPS, so you just want that angular velocity as quickly as possible. You'll see I'm still using the Mystic S at this point. I'm going straight after the Awakened Up holder, again, to get rid of one of those newts and that web. The web is nasty, the web slows us down, which means we take more damage from everything, and even though it's the smaller of the two newts, the fact that I can kill the Awakened Up holder quickly and get rid of, therefore, six gigajoules of neutralization is useful. The Sleepless Up holder, though, does 12 gigajoules of neutralization. Um, I'm still not cap stable, even with that running, so I am gonna have to keep an eye on my capacitor, but it's, you know, it, it is, it's neither here nor there. You'll see I did actually swap ammunition here. The Awakened Preserver is a target I want to take out quickly because it does remote reps. I'd only done two shots with the uh, with the longer range ammunition so the ramp wasn't huge. Quickly swap to a different ammo, start ramping against that Awakened Preserver and take it out nice and quickly. Then when we go after the Sleeper Sub Holder, because it's a battleship, because I'm going to be hitting it fairly comfortably at this range, watch the damage ramp. So we've got a five, six, seven smash immediately there. I'm actually gonna open up the fitting window here and you can see the DPS ramp up in real time. 546.2, 570. Every single cycle, that DPS is going up higher and higher. 617 DPS, 641 DPS. We are encroaching on things like my Proteus fit now. This is actually about to start out DPSing my Proteus. There it goes. It's now about to out DPS my Legion. And in a few seconds, it will actually out DPS my Tengu. My Tengu sits at about 840 DPS with some of the implants and boom, we are now over 840 DPS. We're now coming close to the Praxis fit, C2 Praxis or the Rattlesnake. Those are around the 900 to 1000 mark and we've just cleared 900, 950 basically there, excuse me for that burp, 973, 997, over 1000 DPS and we are still climbing. We're now sitting at about 1,100. Can we beat 1,100? Oh, it's going to be close. 1,116. Oh, 1,139.9 DPS that capped out at there. So that absolutely rinsed through that uh, battleship. That is the advantage of this particular ship. You actually take longer to kill frigates sometimes, uh, the uh, cruisers sometimes, than you do the battleships. Like these awakened defenders are a little bit tanky um, and you just don't get the time to get those rather insane ramps that start chunking it off. Um, it, it's just great. Now, this is a C3 site with a Wolf Raya, but basically the Kikimura can do anything as long as it's a Wolf Raya. C1 and C2, uh, C3, Wolf Raya, it will solo. It can also do C4s if you use a small gang of them, perhaps spider tanking each other. Um, that will work really nicely for clearing C4s. I don't know about C5s, I wouldn't really risk it, but it probably can. Obviously, C13s, you're absolute king of them because you are tripling your DPS, halving your signature radius, um, and getting an additional 50% of your armor. Like, the, the, the Kikimura is the absolute king of C-13s, but I wanted to show that in a C-3, if it's a Wolf Raya, it also beats out any of the other ships that I've showcased. This site has taken me nine minutes to complete. By comparison, my Tech 3 cruisers take about 15 minutes, the Healer and the Rattlesnake take about 12 minutes. This has taken nine minutes to do this site. That is incredible. Anyway, I did also promise a little bit of a fun ending, so I'm going to jump through to the second site that I was running, and I'm going to showcase some real fun that happened to me in there. I'm partway through ratting another fortification frontier, Stronghold at this point, and I've seen an anathema and some Sisters Core scanner probes go live up on D-Scan. That should already be a trigger warning for me, like genuinely that's a bit of a concern. I'm hoping that it's just an explorer, but then I suddenly see him warp in on me. And it takes me too long to try and lock onto him. I probably could have actually taken this guy out and done some really nasty damage to him, but I'm kind of like, right, okay, let's de-scan and see what else is going on around here. I should probably warp to safe, but let's just, you know, 
Keep an eye on D-Scan. Ah, Munin. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Munin's a bit of a concern. Let's start shooting off to my safe point. And then suddenly, three Retributions, a Kikimura, a Sentinel, and the Munin still there. This is a dangerous situation. This is no. Get the hell out of here now. I should have gone to safe rather than home, and there's a Retribution warps in on the site, clearly trying to lock me down and grab me. I'm warping back straight back to Wormhole. Again, this should be a safe point, then the Wormhole, but this time it does actually work in my favour. Because I land on the Wormhole, there's a Retribution there, it's not going to be able to lock me in time before I jump through that hole. It's going to try, it's certainly going to try, but the second that uh, appears for the jump through Wormhole, I am going to do so. And it's time for me to immediately warp off and grab myself back to our home station. So, I'm going to try and do that. I'm going to try and warp through, and the second I hit dock and warp, boof, up goes the warp disruption bubble. That's a bit of an issue, but fortunately, I'm right on the edge of it. And a Talos, mm, Talos isn't overly scary. It's a little bit of a worry. There they are, they've killed my mobile depot. Um, but I'm going to try and get out of here as quickly as possible. That Talos does lock me. It does shoot me all the way down to bottom of shields. I then go to warp a little bit too soon because bam, down goes all the way to lower hull and that arrow, my warp arrow, looks like it's suddenly about to warp back into the bubble. Oh no, I'm going to warp straight into the inter- Oh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't. Isn't that wonderful? And we make an escape with my bum hole clenched as tight as anything I have ever known. Anyway, folks, hope you enjoyed that little finisher there. Oh boy, that was a nice little tense one, but we are now back home safe. Big fleet, we're going to dock up and take this on in a fight, but I'm not going to do so in a PvE Kikimura. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.